uh, with a focus in housing and residence life. To begin, as we allow our, and ask our panelists to introduce themselves, could you briefly tell us about your professional background, what you currently do, and your experience in helping staff prepare for the job search process? Awesome. So I'll get started on that question. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Bryna Matthew. Everyone calls me Dry. Um, and I work at New York University as a residence hall director, uh, where I oversee two buildings, supervise professional staff, and oversee um, just every aspect of the building from community development to making sure that it's standing. Um, and as a residence hall director, I also do various other things within the university as well. I've been with NYU since August of 2011, where I started as a residence hall assistant director and then uh, got promoted as an RHD about a year and a half ago. Um, so as far as my experience with in helping staff prepare for the, uh, the search process, um, the the, one of the big ways that I did it uh, was in our professional staff recruitment process here at New York University. So I was part of that committee for about two and a half years and uh, was very involved with um, you know, resume reviews, all those different things, so just, just hiring in general um, and being at that side of the table. But also, um, in my experiences with uh, mentoring um, folks that are in grad school through our HESA program here at NYU, as well as uh, my alma mater in my master's program at Loyola, mentoring folks who are going through um, the TPE or just job search process in general. Um, and a lot of that has been resume review, mock interviews, and just kind of talking through um, the, the natural anxieties and ambiguities of the search process. Um, and so, again, I've been on both sides of the table as an interviewer and an interviewee, um, and it's, it's interesting to see how uh, technology has played a role in the search process for many folks, and, um, but uh, at the same time, interviewing is still interviewing, so hopefully we'll be able to touch on a lot of those things as well. Great, and my name is Rachel Aho. Uh, and I work as the Assistant Director of Residential Education at the University of Utah. Um, in my position here, I'm responsible for supervising our full-time live-in staff, um, coordinating our student conduct and crisis management efforts, and overseeing our recruitment and selection efforts for our student staff, our graduate staff, um, and our full-time staff um, within our team as well. So throughout my time in housing, um, I've helped um, a variety of undergraduate students, grads, and full-time staff prepare for their next career move, both formally um, and informally, whether that's through organizing mock phone interviews, coordinating resume reviews, uh, facilitating and serving on panels, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring conversations, or taking part uh, in facilita facilitating webinars like this through uh, the placement exchange. So I always think it's fun to see folks progress in their careers and uh, in turn, as they do so, continue to pay it forward. So I'm happy to be here, um, and uh, thank you all for having me and joining in today. Thank you, Rachel. Hi, my name is Julie Leos, and um, I'm happy to be here as well. My, um, I at work at the University of South Florida as one of the assistant directors of residential life and education, and uh, my role as well is to supervise full-time staff here and um, oversee processes such as student staff selection, professional staff selection, and also grad selection. And so um, I think my experience with TPE has, you know, I think is aligned with my role right now as well. I served on the TPE committee for last year and um, was working with educational resources such as Chris McDonald is doing now and um, had a chance to lead some of the efforts for our virtual roundtables and some of the work that we do with coaching at TPE. And so I am always grateful for um, for the great work that TPE does in, in bringing people together to help others to succeed in their careers and to make higher, you know, higher education um, stronger by, by, by what we do and the resources that we offer. And so I, um, I'm excited for the next hour with everyone.
All right, so it looks like um, we are waiting to put our next question up on the screen for you. But what we're hoping to talk about um, next for you is uh, an answer for you is what um, our experience has been in preparing for and participating in both Skype um, and phone interviews um, going forward. And so um, this is Rachel, and, and I've had the opportunity um, once again to both um, participate as a candidate and as an employer. Um, in phone and Skype interviews and have facilitated those processes um, quite frequently, do that on a regular ongoing basis, both during a typical time search timeline um, and mid-year search timeline moving forward. Um, when I have participated as a candidate, um, I have mainly participated in phone interviews as I think that was more common uh, during my, my full-time searches in the past. However, what I would say is um, increasingly institutions are starting to um, take advantage of um, different technology uh, that's available, whether that be through Skype interviews or even Google Hangouts or, or other technology that's available. So I think that's certainly increasing um, as we move forward. At the University of Utah, um, here in my current position, we utilize both phone and Skype interviews um, depending on our particular search and what positions we're looking to fill moving forward. So. Um, each institution uh, may uh, decide or change uh, what formats or venues they're using um, going forward, uh, and that may vary by position, which I think is important to know as well. So if you've heard of folks interviewing with a particular institution and that they've used phone interviews, that may not always be the case depending on what position you're applying for, and they may shift as they decide um, how they'd like to run their searches. Um, what I think is also important to note as uh, you begin your experience in preparing for um, this interview is this is typically going to be your first initial point of contact or your first entry point into the interview process um, with this institution. Particularly for mid-year searches, I would say phone interviews and Skype interviews are very common uh, to be utilized in that regard. Um, however, it's still often used prior to TPE, the placement exchange, um, by some institutions uh, as a means to get in contact with you and gain some familiarity with your skill set um, prior to the in-person interviews that occur there. So it's helpful uh, to be prepared for both of those um, type of issues and also helpful to consider um, which of those venues you feel most comfortable in. Something that our group um, prior to this call has talked about is that sometimes institutions uh, will offer you a choice of whether or not you'd like to um, facilitate or go through a Skype interview or a phone interview with them. Um, and I know that sometimes that can feel like a test um, uh, going forward. You know, if are they looking to see if I'm good with technology? Do I have to accept the Skype interview? Um, really, it's not a test um, by employers going forward. They're uh, most likely trying to be accommodating um, of your needs, um, of what technology you have accessible to you and then give you some options in that search process. But it's helpful to think through that um, so that you have an answer and you feel comfortable and you prepared for both of those venues going forward. So something to consider. Thank you, Rachel. This is Julie. I think um, you, covered, you covered a lot there and some really great pieces of information. I think uh, just a couple of things I would add. Um, in my experience with phone interviews or with, with Skype interviews. Um, I guess I'm going to go to like a little bit of my philosophy of it. So, you know, sometimes um, when we are looking for jobs, a lot of times we get very excited and we want to have as many interviews as possible. And I would say that before you decide to even take a phone interview or a Skype interview, whichever this institution is offering you, and you really take a, a close look at, you know, what are some of your non-negotiables? Would you even expect? that job if they had if offered offered it to you. Um, and there, that's an easy yes or no question that you can email to the chair, whoever you're communicating with, to say, hey, I, you know, I, this is something that needs to happen. Is that possible? And then if not, then, you know, perhaps you don't need to move forward and use up your time and their time. But I also understand that some phone or Skype interview is a great way to understand the role a little bit more. So if your non-negotiables isn't a thing, you know, you find out more about the job based on the phone interview. So I think just knowing what that is um, before you even accept a chance to, to talk with the institution is a great way to start off um, your relationship with the institution. 
Yeah, and I would definitely add Rye here. Um, I would definitely add that on top of the really great things that both um, my colleagues have mentioned is to really also recognize um, that you're, you're, you're going through this interview process, you know, we, social media and all those different things are important. So making sure that, you know, your profile picture looks professional and that um, your screen name um, for your Skype is like good to go and things like that because all those things are um, a way for folks to get to know who you are. Um, and I would definitely say I have been in Skype interviews where you know technology may go awry or uh, phone conversations may be cut off and things like that. And those things happen. Um, so you know when you're preparing for a Skype interview or a phone interview, the preparation that you do would be the same as if you um, were doing a regular interview. So making sure you think about those things um, and recognizing that uh, you need to present yourself from the beginning to the end um, in a way that you feel comfortable and that you uh, feel proud of at the end of the day. Uh, thank you all for your insights uh, to that question. Uh, preparation uh, definitely prevents uh, anxiety um, either doing both phone or a Skype interview. The next question. What are the similarities and differences between a phone and a Skype interview besides the obvious? Sure, Chris. Thank you. Uh, this is Julie again. You know, I think that um, they're, they're, the phone interview and the Skype interview have, uh, have many of the same characteristics in terms of why, why they occur, right? So the, some of the similarities include that, you know, they're, it's the same type of format, whether you're whether you're on a Skype or you're on a phone interview, the main idea, I guess, if, you, if I could say it that way, is that you will have an opportunity to um, introduce yourself and to tell them who you are and for them to ask you some questions about whether um, you might be a good fit for them and you have the experience that, that they need and then have an opportunity for you to, um, to ask them questions based on research that you've already that you've already done prior to the Skype or phone interview, or if anything came up during, um, you know, during the phone interview that you might have questions about. So, the, you know, that is a similarity that I would say you can expect usually the same, the same type of format. Um, I would say also when you prepare for either one of them, I would review the materials that you sent them, right? The resume and the cover letter that they have. Oftentimes they'll want to ask you something about what you wrote in your resume or your cover letter, and you should be familiar with that as well as familiar with the job, um, and that is no different in, in both of those situations. Um, so additionally, I think that both in a Skype interview and in a phone interview, there um, it tends to dampen your personality a bit, right? So it can at least. It doesn't always necessarily have to. So being able to make that extra effort to, to, to smile, whether you're on the phone or on a Skype, and act as much like your pleasant self as possible, that I think will be helpful to you because of the, you know, of the barrier that's there, whether it's on a phone or you know, the technology situation. Um, and so I think some of the differences really is the technology factor, right? So when you're on the you're on the phone, you're not necessarily they're not looking right at you, and so um, sometimes over Skype there might be some delays in how somebody hears you, or um, a lot of times you might feel a little bit anxious because of that, because of your connectivity, and there's so much that you can do to prepare for that. They will get into a little bit later that I think um, you can not have so much anxiety about it based on some things that you can prepare for, all right? And I think a lot of times also, even though they're kind of different, they're, um, you will find that interviewers will ask, you know, can you hear us? And you can ask the same thing if, to see if they can hear you and if everything's okay before you get started. And usually that's accepted because both sides of the table know that, um, that there's some that there's always some some delay, and both sides of the table always know that there's, um, you know, the technology doesn't work 100% all the time, and so there's some recognition there, but also you should do some things to prepare. And additionally, with the prepared, I think to emphasize 
a little bit more on the preparedness piece uh, because oftentimes uh, we can hide behind a phone or we can have multiple screens up when you're doing a Skype interview so maybe you have the website of the school up and those kinds of things so uh, and that can be distractions um, so being prepared uh, the best way you can is the best thing you can do uh, because it'll only make you come off more confident, it will make you come off more prepared and ready um, for the interview to be more present uh, because those things can be very distracting for you personally. So uh, that preparedness piece of not just knowing what you gave them but also um, knowing the school and the institution that you're uh, interviewing with is incredibly important uh, because then in the moment you're being present uh, because again those things can be a phone and a webcam and Technology, maybe working or not working, um, can can really be a factor of all of those things. So it's really important to make sure that preparedness piece is the most important thing. I know that seems the, like the obvious thing, uh, but I think it's something that um, can be overlooked. Um, and so it's just important to make sure we emphasize on the the piece of being prepared. Thank you, Bright. Um, I think the only thing that I would add to what's already been said. Um, in regards to differences between the two is sometimes um, the differences between who will be participating in a phone interview and a Skype interview um, in terms of the number of interviewers uh, or employers on the line may differ. Um, so I have uh, seen a variety of numbers of folks anywhere from one up until eight or even more uh, folks participating on phone calls or phone interviews. Um, going forward, so they may bring the full search committee in to participate in those phone interviews. However, typically with a Skype interview, um, those that grouping of people may be smaller, um, so that they can uh, you can see them, you can fit in. Um, we all have seen uh, certain situations too where uh, employers are are bringing more folks in, so they may turn the screen uh, so that you can see who's in there, and then you just may have to note um, and know that there are more individuals beyond uh, what you can see on the screen, but they, again, can still see you on a Skype inter interview going forward. Um, and I know it's uh, probably obvious as well, but you are making a physical impression, um, not just a vocal impression, uh, when you're on a Skype interview as well. So attire um, and professionalism and consideration for attire um, is something that uh, you should certainly give thought to in preparation um, efforts to as well uh, in terms of that. Um, also noting, um, in terms of a vocal impression, um, how you sound, how what your tone looks like um, going forward, as that, again, is going to be the, the main way of communicating in that. Um, and your ability to read and respond to body language is completely different um, on a phone interview versus a Skype interview. So uh, those are a couple additional things uh, to add to what uh, Julie and Bry have already brought up. Uh, thank you all. I would um, also add, just because this is something I've had to take into account before, uh, your physical presence, kind of more along what Rachel was sharing, uh, I don't have any hair. And, and that seems somewhat comical, but and I, I need to worry about lighting uh, when I'm doing a Skype interview. Uh, I don't want to necessarily think about my left side or my uh, But I definitely want to make sure that I'm not having any other kind of physical distractions because uh, without having, you know, my hair, my head might show something uh, much like a, a bad piece of jewelry would, and it might be a distraction. It, it sounds almost comical, but it's something that I definitely worry about when I'm doing anything over video. Um, that physical presence, that physical impression uh, that everyone's mentioned is, is very important. So testing that out, uh, having someone maybe test it with you, connect with someone, see what is behind you, so that's not something that people will key off of more than what you have to say. Uh, just as a bit of quick housekeeping, uh, we do have a lot of questions that have been submitted prior to today's webinar. We will definitely do our best to get to all of them at the conclusion of the formatted questions. However, if there are additional questions while our panelists are sharing uh, their information, please feel free to include those by clicking on the questions tab in your dashboard. You can ask questions in that form uh, and if they are unique to the questions that we are preparing to answer based off your prior submissions, but we will do our best to get to them as well. Next question, what is the appropriate amount of time to respond to an average question? 
Um, that's that is a really good question, and it's one that is there's a a real um, number. I would say we uh, Julie, uh, Rachel, and I when you were preparing for this, we were kind of averaging it out, and it seemed like okay, if there were 10 questions being asked um, in a 30 to 45 minute interview via phone or Skype, we would say it would be about, what, one to three minutes uh, per question, correct? Because um, that's kind of how math works, right? Um, and, and leaving some time at the end for questions you may have uh, for um, the candidate, uh, for the, for the interviewers as well. Um, but honestly, the it all depends on the question um, and the nature of the question and what it's, what it's being asked. So it's really important when you're going through the interview process, uh, regardless of Skype or phone, that you're actually listening to the question and making sure that there is a, um, there is a understanding of what it is that um, they are looking for. So if they're asking a question about your experiences, make sure um, that your uh, answers are relating to that. Um, and I just realized when you speak about math, it's actually three to four and a half minutes. Thank you, Julie, for reminding me about that in the chat that we have. Um, and so with that being said, again, it's, it's practice makes perfect when it comes to answering questions. Um, so a bit of one of the questions that you will definitely get asked, regardless of if it's the first interview with via Skype or phone, or whether you're a TP or on campus, is that elevator pitch. Who are you? Why do you want this job? Um, so it's really important to practice that elevator pitch because you'll use it a lot, and you'll use it um, often in networking networking places, but also the interview process. And the elevator pitch will look different and sound a little bit different as you go through the process of the interview um, throughout the interview um, season. But it's something, again, that you should know at the back of your back of your mind. Um, so, and one of the things that we often, um, that I often tell folks, and we discussed as a group too, is thinking about the question in three different ways. Um, you want to answer the question, any question that's asked, asked of you, with this notion of, here's my philosophy behind the question that you're asking, here's my experience and evidence that's showing how my philosophy works, and this is how I would apply it in the job if you were to give me the job. So those are kind of like the three things, the philosophy, your experience, and how I would use my experience and my philosophy into the job that I'm about to have or about, uh, about uh, that I'm interviewing for. Um, and that's really a lot of the time when you're going through the Skype and phone interview, you're doing it, most folks are doing behavioral interviewing questions. Um, so the assumption is that your past behavior will predict um, your future behavior. So in this case, how do you package up your experiences in a way that will help others know you and how you think and act and reflect and learn from your experiences. So it's important to really, again, listen to the question, um, but also at the same time making sure that you're answering that question in a way that they're able to receive it. Um, and again, past behavior uh, predicts future behavior. Uh, and that's what folks are looking for. I know that's what I look for when I interview folks, whether they're RAs or professional staff, um, student staff or professional staff, because it's important for me to know that um, you're listening and that here, here's what here's what I have to offer and here and here are the experiences that prove that this is what I'm thinking and doing. So I think those things are when you say here's the appropriate amount of time for an average question, it really depends. But really if you go through that the notion that we I just mentioned of philosophy, your your philosophy on the question, your experiences, and how do you, how would you apply that to the job? You would you'd be in good hands. And again, being brief um, and succinct is always going to be a great way to move the conversation forward. Absolutely. I would definitely agree with that. Employers want to know that you can communicate clearly with conviction and in a succinct manner. Um, so what I would also recommend is that you do re your own reflection about your work prior to the interview, not during. Um, what I see a mistake, a common mistake candidates making oftentimes is um, talking themselves through their philosophy and almost uh, beginning to make sense of that or making discoveries about their philosophy during the interview question as they're thinking out loud. Um, and what that demonstrates to me as an employer is that they haven't completed that previous reflection or done that reflection prior to the interview um, in order to appropriately answer that question. Um, in a succinct manner. So do that reflection ahead of time. 
um, start doing that now if you haven't already. Oftentimes, if you are at the graduate student level, um, a lot of your coursework helps to facilitate that reflection. But if you're not getting that, it is well worthwhile um, sitting down and taking some time to journal, to write out what are your best examples um, for a variety of behavioral questions. So what is your absolute best example um, of your work within a conduct setting as a conduct hearing officer? So that should you get a question about your style, your philosophy, et cetera, you've already done that, uh, done that prior preparation and that work, and you're able uh, to recall that and bring that information back uh, forward into, into what you're doing. So do that prior uh, reflection um, ahead of the interview, not during, and that will help you to stay on track um, with the amount of time uh, that you have during that interview as well. Thank you, Rachel. I, um, you know, I don't know if I have anything else to add to that. They did a great job. Yes, they did. Um, the only thing to kind of continue off of Rachel again, that seems to be my habit this time, uh, in that preparation, the, the best answer is one that comes natural. And so the more time that you spend going through what you anticipate your questions to be and the responses that you have to them, the more natural you're going to sound, the more uh, um, organic it's going to be as a response versus something that seems canned, overly prepared, uh, and will differentiate between uh, your, you and other candidates. Uh, it's an invaluable uh, experience that you might have in sharing uh, that might set you apart from a different candidate. Uh, our next question, what prep do you recommend to ace a Skype interview? We've been talking a lot about prep, but what may be specific uh, do you think that a Skype interview uh, is required to ace? Absolutely, and we, we have been talking a lot about prep, and I think one of the first things to do when prepping uh, for a Skype interview is to actually set up an account um, early to find a friend or a colleague, a mentor, uh, to practice um, and uh, do a mock interview or test call with uh, so that you have utilized the, this technology, not just with a friend on a Friday night catching up um, who you haven't talked to, um, in a few months, but really in a format um, that mimics an interview setting um, so that you can set an exact time, let's, let's talk at 2 o'clock, um, let's log on at that time, and then you can start to anticipate how long does it take me to log on, how long should I um, anticipate if my computer suddenly decides that it wants to update um, right, be right before that interview. What, what type of technology prep can you do um, so that you become very comfortable with that um, ahead of time. Um, pick your location um, as well. Uh, we've been talking about this a little bit, but it's very important um, to pick a location that's not on, only going to be private and quiet, um, where you won't have a lot of background uh, noise and distractions um, going forward, but also one uh, that um, is clean and professional in the background. Um, so. For example, if I were to be on video right now in my office, um, you would see um, the, what I have uh, directly behind me, and I have some papers sitting out right now, I have some books, um, et cetera. I might stage that a little bit differently if I were to be doing a Skype interview to make it non-distracting um, going forward so that folks are not wondering, oh, look at that book uh, in the back of, that's sitting there. I've always wanted to read that book. You want to eliminate as many distractions as you can um, so that uh, folks can focus on you um, and uh, ensure that the attention is on you. Um, I think some of the things that uh, we have seen in uh, Skype interviews before are, are individuals' animals or pets. If they're completing the, the interview at home, and as much as we love cats and dogs, our attention then becomes on uh, the animal uh, versus them. Lighting, Chris already mentioned that. Um, we've seen lighting that makes it difficult. Uh, for us to interact with or, or view the candidate uh, either too bright um, or too dark. So again, focusing um, on that. And we've also uh, seen where uh, outside distractions, where folks interrupt, walk into uh, the screen. Uh, if you're doing it in your office, is there a way for you to mute your phone? Uh, if a phone call rings or have folks hold that 
uh, those phone calls for you. These are all considerations to make um, prior to your call so that you can, again, make sure that the attention stays on you and uh, your employers are able to truly hear the answers and the great information that you're sharing with them. So a lot of technology prep, um, ensuring that you have a strong internet connection um, is important as well. So if you need to plug in uh, to a hardwired Ethernet uh, port, now is the time uh, to do it if your Wi-Fi connection or wireless connection uh, can go in and out uh, moving forward. So a lot of technology prep, um, picking your location, practicing uh, that Skype interview with someone um, is really going to help you to be successful um, in that Skype uh, that Skype interview format. Um, I'll turn it over to Julie to talk a little bit more about um, some other tips going forward. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I always learn so much from Rachel, by the way. She's fantastic. Um, so I'm going to say a couple, so a couple of things. So no proper webcam etiquette. So um, I, so right now in my office, I have two screens, but the camera is just on one, and so. I'm looking at a few things here, but you want to make sure that you know where the camera is and that you're looking at it properly. And um, if you have to, I know that when it, the three of us were talking um, the other day about what tips we would share, we um, all kind of said, yeah, you know what I do is I put a little post-it right here next to the camera that somebody else had gave, you know, somebody else gave us the advice that that's probably a good idea because then if you forget, like, that's, you know, that's where you look. Like, that's where they're going to be, um, they can see you from. And so that's important. The other thing um, to know about the camera, too, is um, going back to what Rachel says, is to practice and to even like let have the person on the other side give you some feedback about that. Because the truth is, they're seeing you the whole time. So I um, I know that you know if you think that just because you're not talking, they're not seeing you, like they are. So you know if you're fixing your hair, or if you're turning around, or if you're doing other things that are distracting, like you don't disappear when you stop talking. So you just need to know that that is con that is on. Um, so that's one advice about that. The other thing um, related to post-its and to notes is just that sometimes it's okay to have something in front of you um, that kind of like a small little cheat sheet. But I wouldn't say, like, you shouldn't have pages, right? So one of the things that uh, we said earlier is that multitasking isn't something that you need to master during a, during a Skype interview. If you want to have full, a few bullet points, that's fine. Um, if you want to have, you know, a notepad so you can write notes, that's fine. But I wouldn't have too many things out there to distract you. You're not going to have the answers to your questions there. You're just going to have some main points about what you want to make sure that, that you talk about. And so I think that that's important to to keep in mind because that can be distracting for you and for the people who are um, trying to pay very close attention to the things that you're saying. Brenna? Yeah, thanks. Um, again, my colleagues are wonderful and they said some really amazing things um, to really help really ace that Skype interview because, again, Skype interviews can be an interesting um, an interesting experience. Uh, what, some, some other things to consider uh, to ace a Skype interview is your personal tics. Um, so the things, any filler words you use, any ums and likes, um, if you have, uh, if you often play with your hair or, um, you know, adjust yourself or just even um, using your hands a lot, those things can be very distracting. So that practice that we've often talked about um, already today um, is really important to help you realize, okay, these things are my ticks. Like when I, I talk with my hands a lot, so I recognize that I could be distracting to somebody and helping kind of maybe pull that back a little bit. Um, maybe I say of oh, or like quite often. So if that is something that I do, really kind of helping make that not be something that is consistent in the way that I answer the questions and the way that I present myself because it is much, very much a physical um, physical interaction too, even though it's via via the interwebs. So those, I think those two things are, to, are things to think about, about some of those filler words you may use or the tics that you may have personally um, and how distracting that could be for the interviewer. Um, and also recognizing that that the interviewer may also have ticks and things that might be distracting to you as well, and how do you combat that when that happens? Um, so making sure that, again, those preparation things that we, we spoke about earlier is going to be really helpful in making sure that you're ace the best kind of interview. And, you know, some people, um, 
to do a Skype interview with like Peter Adams and like a blazer on. If that's the way that you do things, cool. But again, as we mentioned before, it's important that that visually you're presenting yourself professionally um, and that as you're doing that, you're doing it in a way um, that shows that you're the best candidate for the job. So again, dress for the dress for the success. Look the dress for success. Look the part, um, and because that is going to innately, I know for me personally, when I put my suit on or if I, you know, if everything feels and looks right for me, I have the right amount of makeup. My hair feels my hair feels right, my attire feels great, I know that I'm coming off confident. Um, so your physical appearance and the way that you present yourself, sitting up while you are answering questions. I know I tend to slouch when I sit on my chair, but sitting up and presenting myself um, confidently will also, again, help prepare me for that successful and acing that Skype interview. So when you think about your, all those things, and all the things that we mentioned, these are just some of the many things you can do to really ace that Skype interview. And many of the things that we discussed are things that um, you have control over. Uh, because sometimes, let's be very honest, that during the interview process um, and the interview journey, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of things you may not have control over. But the things that you do have control over, I think it's important to make sure you prepare and um, and and do and to give the best shot um, in what you're doing. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, I would just solidify by saying, perceive the Skype interview as the purest facsimile of an in-person interview you can. You need to prepare for it and feel you're presenting yourself as much as you are when you actually arrive at the placement exchange or whatever avenue you might be uh, pursuing, uh, and think of it in that uh, that sense as, as best you can. Uh, and practice looking at the camera. It's a very awkward feeling. It's very easy to want to default and look at how you look and how they look. Uh, but you know, again, with that facsimile in mind, that's your eye contact. That's them looking at your eyes, and, and you, we all know how much you communicate with your eyes when you speak. Uh, next question, uh, basically the same. What prep do you recommend to ace a phone interview? Sure. Thank you, Chris. This is Julie. Um, so there are some of the things for a phone interview that are kind of the same as for the Skype, but um, a few of the, the things with just a different take on it is that, um, so let's go first with dress for success like we talked about earlier in Skype. As Brian has said, it's really important to do that because if you feel right, you will do, you know, you will do a good job. Um, one of the things for a phone interview is that nobody necessarily can see you, right? And so a lot of times people just um, don't feel the need to completely um, dress professionally during that time. But I think that it's uh, that it's really important that you do that because you will then um, feel complete about, you know, doing this professional piece of doing an interview. Um, I would say the same thing applies for a phone interview of figuring out where, what your location is. Um, and making sure that there aren't any distractions around you that, you know, I remember doing um, a phone interview once in my office when I worked at Florida State many years ago, and there was somebody outside, it was kind of um, when the, the students had already left and there was a facilities guy out there with a jackhammer doing something, and I couldn't prevent that. I didn't know they were going to be there. So it's just kind of one of those things where what can you do to minimize um, what, you think the outside factors will be that will that will um, distract anything during that time, and I would say on the same um, line is that you know there I think there's a debate about landline versus cell phones, and I don't know that I can have an opinion about that right now simply because I know that a lot of people don't have landlines at their house, right? So if you are somebody that um, does not want to have a phone interview at your job, you know, based on whatever it is the philosophy is of the place where you work. Maybe you want to do this at home and you take a half day off. Well, if you don't have landline, then you probably are going to be using a cell phone. And so if you're doing that, what can you do to make um, And furthermore, about that is that you need to be able to sound strong. And what I mean by sound strong is it's a good idea to have some kind of um, microphone-enabled head headphones or even the USB-connected ones. Um, 
so that you can, so that the sound can come in more clear from a cell phone through the other line. And then also so you can have your hands free to talk or look through, um, maybe you have, and to write notes or whatever you need to do depending on, um, on your style for that. So I would say that that's something to consider is how, is what type of phone you are going to use. And then um, also smile. I think we've talked about this a few times, but it really does help that you are smiling. I hope you can hear my smile through this, but I am. Um, you know, they can, if you are having a good time talking about yourself and um, sharing with them um, your passions and the work that you've done, um, they can feel the energy coming through the phone. and. Um, differently than a Skype, but still they can do that. So I wanted to make sure that you all know that that, that comes through just as clearly as the words that you're saying and what they can and cannot see. I definitely say you covered just about everything, Julie. Um, I, I think many of the things that we talked about in um, the Skype interview applies also for the phone interview. It's just that physical presence isn't there, but they can hear everything. So just think about the filler words, try not to multitask. Um, all those different things still apply as well when you do the phone interview. Absolutely. I think the only thing that I would also add, um, because of the lack of visual presence as well as to be um, even more cognizant um, and thoughtful about um, your use of humor or jokes as well as it's a lot harder to read the response of your audience um, if that's being received well um, going forward. For, for all you know, um, your audience members may, have, may be smiling and may be fully engaged um, or you could have just completely uh, disengaged them. Uh, your use of humor um, and how that came across on a, on a phone interview and their pens may be down. Um, at this point going forward. So just be cognizant um, of that uh, and anything that you might be sharing with them, particularly given uh, the lack of body language that you're going to be able to um, assess as you go forward. And that's something to consider as well um, as you end either a Skype or a phone interview. Um, your ability to gauge how things went I think often feels, uh, feels different. Um, at the end of that, particularly with the phone interview, as you haven't gotten those visual cues, um, those nods, those um, smiles from, from other individuals, and it's harder to read tone as well. So if you get off the phone interview, just give some credence uh, to that as well. If you feel like it didn't go as well as you would have wanted it to, it could have very well gone um, extremely well um, in that case, um, but again, because of the visual uh, barriers um, and lack of your ability to read that, um, you could be perceiving it differently. So give yourself um, some credit if you've done that preparation work, if you feel like you've been able to deliver your content um, and smile throughout that, sound strong, um, you likely did well um, in that process going forward. So have some encouragement in that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we do have some submitted questions that we'd like to try and get to before we conclude today's virtual roundtable or webinar. Uh, style and um, who you are. I know for me, I would be distracted by 